Questions about right triangles come up in many different situations. For example, this jogger runs around the edges of a rectangular lot, while another takes the diagonal shortcut. How much farther is it to run all the way around rather than cutting the corner? The shortest distance between two points is a straight line, so the diagonal distance C is certainly smaller than A plus B. But how much smaller is it? In this situation, ladders are used to form right triangles. Suppose we know the height of the wall and the width of the moat. How long should the ladder be to reach the top of the wall? Here's another place where right triangles pop up. Eliza Dixon is a wind prospector. In this business, what you do is you go out and you look at land, you prospect. You take measurements to see how windy the site is. Okay. In a mountain pass, she That's looks good. for a good place to catch the wind, to convert its energy into electric power. Dixon and an assistant raise a 30-foot tower, topped by an anemometer, a wind speed indicator. They know the height of the tower and the length of each guy wire. Where should the guy wires be fastened on the ground so the tower will be vertical when it is lifted into place? The altitude is 10 yards, the hypotenuse is 12 yards. How long is the other side? We can answer all these questions by looking at one mathematical problem. Find the length of one side of a right triangle when the lengths of the other two sides are known. Here's one way to solve it. Draw a line from the right angle perpendicular to the hypotenuse, breaking it into two segments, X and Y. This divides the triangle into two smaller right triangles. And all three triangles are similar, so ratios of corresponding sides are equal. Now, we multiply both sides here by A to solve for X. And these ratios of corresponding sides are equal. We multiply by B to solve for Y. Now remember, the hypotenuse C is made up of two parts, X and Y. Putting these in for X and Y, we find C equals A squared plus B squared divided by C. So, C squared equals A squared plus B squared. The square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. This result simple, elegant, and quite unexpected, is called the Pythagorean Theorem. The algebraic formula has a simple geometric interpretation. Because we're talking about a squared and b squared and c squared, let's think of this in terms of squares. The area of the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the areas of the squares on the two legs. This is the geometric meaning of the algebraic formula. The Pythagorean theorem is named in honor of Pythagoras, who lived in ancient Greece in the 6th century BC. One of the oldest and most important theorems in mathematics, it has been rediscovered again and again in many different cultures. Oh.
Let's see how the Pythagorean theorem solves our original problems. If A and B are given and you want to find C, take the square root of both sides. For example, in the case of the jogger, if A is 40 yards and B is 30 yards, then C is equal to 50 yards. You save 20 yards by taking the diagonal shortcut. As for the length of the ladder, the square root of 20 squared plus 8 squared should be a little more than 21 and a half feet to reach the top of the wall. Now this time we know the hypotenuse and the length of one leg. The Pythagorean theorem tells us how to find the other leg. The cable should be attached about 6.63 yards out from the tower. When all three sides of a right triangle are integers, that is, whole numbers, they are said to form a Pythagorean triple. Here's one with 3, 4, and 5, and 5, 12, and 13. Another one, 8, 15, and 17, and there are many more. Pythagorean triples were known 1,200 years before the time of Pythagoras. This Babylonian clay tablet written in the dynasty of Hammurabi around 1700 BC contains 15 examples of Pythagorean triples. No one knows why the Babylonians were interested in these triples, and as far as we can tell, they didn't know the theorem of Pythagoras. We don't know for sure how Pythagoras proved this theorem, but he might have done it like the Chinese did. Make four copies of the original triangle. Now, put this over to one side as a reference. Slide the triangles around, and we see that the area B squared plus A squared does indeed equal C squared. You can also see that this works for any right triangle. The Pythagorean theorem has come down to us through the ages in Euclid's Elements. Written around 300 BC, it consisted of 13 books that contain much of the mathematics known at that time. Well arranged, well presented, it was a masterful achievement that changed the course of civilization. Euclid's geometry has appeared in dozens of languages and hundreds of editions. Its ideas and point of view have been used almost unchanged for more than 2,000 years. The Pythagorean Theorem appears in Book 1 as Proposition 47. Drop a perpendicular to the hypotenuse and extend it to divide the large square into two rectangles. Euclid showed that this square and this rectangle have equal areas. And this square and this rectangle have equal areas, and here's why. First, this triangle has half the area of the square. Its area doesn't change if we shear it like this, or if we rotate it. Shearing it once more, we see that, indeed, its area is half that of the rectangle. So, the square and the rectangle do have equal areas. And we can do the same thing on the other side. Here's a variation of this proof that some people like better. All parallelograms of the same base and altitude have equal areas. So, all these parallelograms have equal areas, as do all these.
And that's all there is to it. We can increase our understanding of the Pythagorean theorem by looking at different ways of proving it. Here's one you can do by yourself with a pair of scissors. Make a copy of the small square and trace around it in the middle of the large square. Make cuts along the sides and out to the edges. Then you can rearrange the pieces. All the pieces in the big square now fit exactly inside the other two squares. This figure appears in Euclid's book six as proposition 31. Proposition 31 claims that if the squares are replaced by similar rectangles or any other three shapes similar to one another, the area of the two smaller shapes adds up to equal the area of the larger shape. Now, why should we believe this? What is it about similar shapes that's important here? Areas of similar shapes are proportional to the squares of the lengths of the corresponding edges. So, area A is SA squared, area B is SB squared, and area C is SC squared. If the edges happen to fit around a right triangle, the Pythagorean theorem applies, and we can multiply by S to get proposition 31. But there's something else going on here that Euclid may or may not have realized. We can turn the argument around. If proposition 31 is true, then we can divide by S to get the Pythagorean theorem. So, proposition 31 is equivalent to the Pythagorean theorem. And now we can discover something remarkable that both Pythagoras and Euclid overlooked. First, Notice that it doesn't matter whether the three shapes are on the outside or not. So if we just use these three similar triangles, we can find yet another proof of the Pythagorean theorem, perhaps the simplest proof of all. Because the areas of the two smaller triangles obviously add up to the area of the larger one, the Pythagorean theorem is proved yet again. The theorem of Pythagoras has many applications. For example, the distance from one corner on the floor to the opposite corner on the ceiling can be calculated by using the theorem twice. There is one right triangle on the floor and another perpendicular to the floor. The square of the diagonal is the sum of the squares of the three edges of the room. We set out to answer the following question about right triangles. How do you find the length of one side if you know the lengths of the other two sides? We've done that with the help of similar triangles, and the answer is both elegant and surprising. The square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the legs. We also saw how the Pythagorean theorem can be proved by rearranging polygonal pieces. Then we found another remarkable fact. The squares on the three sides can be replaced by any shapes, whatever so long as they are similar to one another. Because the area of each shape is proportional to the square of the side on which it's drawn, the area of the large shape is the sum of the areas of the two smaller shapes, and the result is equivalent to the theorem of Pythagoras.
finally, we learned that the Pythagorean theorem can be extended to three-dimensional space. The Pythagorean theorem is one of the most important results in all of mathematics. In a later program, we'll see the Pythagorean theorem put to work in trigonometry. This is getting a little ahead of our story, but sometimes it helps to have a preview of things to come. Suppose we call this angle T. If we expand or contract a triangle, we change the lengths of the sides, but we don't change the angle T or the two ratios, A over C or B over C. The Pythagorean theorem tells us that the squares of these two ratios add up to one. The ratio A over C depends on the angle T and is called the sine of T. The ratio B over C is called the cosine of T. The Pythagorean theorem shows that the square of sine T plus the square of cosine T is equal to one. This equation, which is true for any angle T, is a fundamental result in trigonometry. When we measure right triangles over relatively short distances on the surface of the Earth, we find that the Pythagorean theorem is verified as closely as we can measure. But when we measure over large distances, things seem to go wrong. Why? Well, the Earth is not flat. So what appears to be a triangle on a map is not an ordinary triangle, but what we call a spherical triangle with curved sides. While spherical triangles share many properties with flat triangles, we'll learn in a later program that they differ in significant respects, and the differences become more pronounced when the triangle covers a large part of the spherical surface. For example, this spherical triangle has three right angles and three equal sides. And the Pythagorean theorem does not hold for such triangles. The Pythagorean theorem is a fundamental property of right triangles that lie in a plane.